Hello and welcome to PMFM. I'm JP Quinn and today I'm joined by Reese Samani of Signature RX and The Local Map. And we are going to be talking paperless pharmacies, AI and other sort of tech in pharmacy. So it's going to be great. I absolutely love Reese to death. He's in infinitely knowledgeable and insightful and innovative. Uh, and I really, really wanted to get him on. Uh, so I was really happy so that we could finally sit down and talk about all of these things. And I'm sure you're going to love it. So stick around for the rest of the video. I was sort of thinking of, a, of the title of the video, like, how to go paperless as a pharmacy because there's a there's a pharmacy in Sheffield Fox Hill Pharmacy I, I don't know if they're Absolutely. still the only one sorry turn that off yeah. um I don't know if they're still the only paperless pharmacy but it was certainly that the first one you know, like they, they kind of made the news yeah, yeah. And with they've gone fully paperless I was going to oh. say what is it what how much further is there to go after you've made prescriptions paperless to make to go fully Ooh. paperless or or is that kind of it you know what, like, th this is the thing, right? The NHS want to go paperless because they want to be better for the environment. But the biggest issue they have is prescriptions. Like, I think it's one of the hardest things to make paperless properly. Um, in my opinion, in pharmacy, mainly because it's, like, unregulated. It's kind of in this, like, private prescriptions are in this in-between. Like, who really looks over it? You know, is it the CQC or the GPHC and how do we manage it? Um, so that's why paperless prescriptions in the pharmacy side outside of the NHS are quite hard to do. But on the NHS, I think we're already digital there. Like we already have e-prescriptions. I think every pharmacy is used to seeing e-prescriptions on a day-to-day -day basis. Like that's what most pharmacies see in England. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the process? That, like why, why are there still, like this is from an outsider looking in, I kind of, I kind of go, why are, they, why are there still paper prescriptions? Why? What, you know, if Honestly? it's... What's the biggest barrier? I, what's what's stopping people? I have no idea. And, and here's the crazy part, JP. Like, I could literally, if I was a prescriber, and obviously I'm not, but if I was a prescriber, I could get a piece of paper or a tissue at a pub with you, write a prescription out and give it to you, and it would be legal. And that's the craziest part. And it's just, I don't understand how that's being accepted more widely than an e-prescription that's a lot more secure, a lot safer, and better for the environment, because that's still a big part of it. Yeah, well, I was I was sort of reading um, I, I was reading around the subject, and I thought I saw some stuff. Granted, it's in the US, but there were there's the states that have basically made it illegal for controlled drugs to be on yeah. anything other than e prescriptions because obviously there's there's that paper trail, and yeah, yeah, yeah. well, the the weird thing is we we say paper trail, but actually the best <laughs> paper trail is a paperless trail where it's like. Yeah. Day, you know it's approved and it's digitized yeah you've got, yeah. You've got oh, i can track it every 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 step of the way um That's it. i agree with you i don't know i don't know what, what how it can be yeah legal to write a prescription on a napkin as you say yeah when that's um, a forgery ireland do it so what well actually i'll give you i'll give you a use case afterwards but in ireland it's the same you can't issue a private script unless it's through their own system which I think is a really good way to do it because you can audit, you know, bad prescribing, you can audit when things go wrong. And we've had cases where doctors have come up to us and said to us, you know, we gave a patient a paper prescription in clinic. And that patient's obviously copied the prescription, re-signed it with an ink signature, gone to 10 different pharmacies in the local area and got caught eventually after going to through many pharmacies. But, you know, these are drugs of abuse that can easily be given to patients just by them copying the signature there's not real there's no real security requirements or anything on paper scripts um and it's not hard i'm not saying that you know all patients are like this but it's really not hard to forge a signature for a, forge a prescription but it is hard to hack a system and generate an electronic prescription that's going to be you know not audited and kind of bypass whole security features of it yeah like um, i completely agree um I, like, I was i was i was thinking that and, and it's i, I liken it a bit to checks it sort of feels like pharmacies are still wandering around using the equivalent of checks and it's like yeah stop accepting checks it's like well, <laughs> I take card for, for god's sake man well, the worst part of it is they're using fax machines still like i can't remember the last time i saw a fax machine like why are we still using them in pharmacies they need to be in the bin right now like it's yeah it's worse than those nokia 3310s that we used to have back in the day like no one uses them anymore so no one would use a fax machine they shouldn't be things yeah well so <laughs> why is it what what's stopping 
I guess, community farms is there. So so forget waiting for legislation to come around. Like, you yeah. know, if, if I'm a proactive pharmacist, how do I go about but what, going paperless? Like what, how do I, how do I do that? Uh, so e-prescription wise, I can talk all day, but going paperless, if you really think about it, most of your things, uh, NHS e-prescriptions and private e-prescriptions, right? Like they're the things that you'd want to go paperless. And once you do that, I think everything else is just dispensing labels, which is probably the only paper you're going to use within pharmacy. If you, yeah. so there's a pharmacy like we spoke about earlier in Sheffield that had a certain PMR system that the script would come in electronically. The pharmacy would then scan the medication items. I think that's how it works. And then the, um, the dispensing labels automatically printed off. The clinical check and all the, all the checks are done on the computer, which is how they can make it paperless. And it would make the whole process so much easier. Um, well, that's the thing. Yeah, it, 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 forget forget the environment. It, you know, it, it, it it's it's surely a massive benefit to the pharmacy, and I can't understand yeah, yeah. quite why it's not higher on the agenda. Is it is it really expensive? Is it you know like what what what's stopping these pharmacies from just adopting this these systems? I don't think it's expense. I think part of it is like as in it's only a small part of it. Part of it is awareness of the technology that's out there. Um, how many pharmacies are actually aware of what they can do to reduce the paper and also invest in change like you to change someone's mindset like you know um i'm owner of x pharmacy and i've had this pharmacy for 40 years it served me well for so long why would i change so it's it's mainly awareness and talking to people and explaining to them why things can be done better and what benefits it brings to their pharmacy um and i think that's one of the sides and obviously with the multiples it's we have X number of hundred or thousand pharmacies to work through. Is it going to justify us retraining each pharmacy one by one? Like, what are we going to get back out of it? And I think part of it, especially from the um, NHS side, e-prescription on the NHS, you still have to print the dispensing token. And there's only one PMR system that allows you to go paperless. So it's still more expensive. It's still a monopoly of the market. And it's more expensive to retrain and buy in that PMR system to make it all paperless. So, I think the technology is going that way and I think it's taking steps forward, but it needs some really big leaps to really kick this off into the whole market and make it roll out nationally. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess, like you said, if there's, there's only, if there's only one PMR system, I think I'll probably guess which one it is as well. Um, <laughs> it's not an endorsement video, so you can't say anything. Like <laughs> that can do this. It, it'll, I guess it's like most technology, it'll only be a matter of time before others, you know, adapt or adopt or are able to provide that same thing and then and then you like i'd imagine obviously it gets cheaper and then it probably will will roll yeah out. yeah that's it and it's about explaining to these female companies why it's so important and like what benefits would it bring to the pharmacy their workflow um patient safety like how quickly they can dispense medication and i think a lot needs to be done case study wise as well to, to prove that mm, yeah well th that's that's just that's a strange thing do you, do you think that how much do you think that? How do you think? How much do you think community pharmacists or what any pharmacist or pharmacy owners, superintendents, you know, the, the the full range of decision makers? How much do you think they have to rely on stats versus social proof? Because I think that social proof among pharmacies, you know, you know how many WhatsApp groups yeah, yeah. exist and things. <laughs> like one, all it takes is one person to say. <laughs> Like this is working, you know. Like this is this makes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just needs one person, the right person, to say this makes my life so much easier. Right yeah. Or, or you know, like a an article written that that you know in in one yeah, of the yeah. magazines that says, look at you know, look how much easier this made, and suddenly people go, oh yeah, yeah, that that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's literally all it is. Like the reliance on like word of mouth is huge, but it's it's a relatively small community, especially with independents. Like everyone will somehow know everyone that knows someone. Um, which means that word of mouth carries a lot of weight. And I found that a lot. Um, you, you actually see it quite often. Like a lot of people tend to follow the same trends within pharmacy, mainly because of word of mouth and their colleagues are doing that thing. And um, yeah, I agree. I think it's huge. I, I've, been write, I've been writing all day or all week, it feels like, um, this, an article on pharmacy automation. And, and, and this, this sort of ties into it. And I almost just think, Whilst paperless pharmacy is probably like a good way to, yeah, you no, know, tag it. It almost feels like a lot of people might shrug and go, oh, "I don't really care about using yeah, paper," yeah, and, and it it kind of misses the actual issue of, of what it solves. It, tell me, 
I can't remember exactly the story you were telling me um, around yeah. the, like essentially the duplications of it. I mean, I know you, you mentioned it pre previously before, but Signature RX is like a private e-prescription tool. So essentially what we did and what we set out to do is create paperless e-prescriptions that are safer, more secure, and just easier for the pharmacies to dispense. So I think patient safety on paper prescriptions is really overlooked because we've kind of been used to it for so long. We've only known paper prescriptions, you know, the ones that you see on a piece of paper that can be forwarded, that can be duplicated. So no one really thinks of the implications of it. But with the rise of telemedicine, I think it's the legislation hasn't kept up enough. So as a telemedicine provider, you can create an e-commerce store. You know, anyone with WordPress skills can create an e-commerce store online, get a prescriber that's a bit dodgy. Uh, and again, not saying prescribers are dodgy, but get a prescriber that's open, need to, open to prescribe certain things, um, sell medication at really expensive prices, issue a script, sign it on paper and post it to that patient. And there are so many pharmacies that it'd be really difficult for a pharmacy to really audit anyone to audit that. The NHS couldn't audit it. The pharmacies couldn't really keep track. And again, it's word of mouth that would potentially even flag this in local areas. Um, you know, I've been flagged to dodgy scripts by a WhatsApp group of my local pharmacy areas. So it's quite an, un an unregulated way of issuing scripts. So we had a case um, a few months ago where a doctor joined up, issued prescriptions, and we weren't happy with their prescribing habits. So what we did is realized it was not safe to prescribe what they're prescribing and, and the quantities we were doing it we blocked their accounts and void all their scripts immediately. So that's something you can't do on paper. You can't just suddenly go around knocking on everyone's door, finding these random patients and then destroying their scripts and shredding them. They're still gonna be in circulation. Yeah. And it just makes me think like with obviously controlled drugs in the NHS, um, you have an FB10 CD requirement, even privately, you have to write them on an FB10 CD form. So the NHS will audit everything that goes through, whether it was written on paper or computer, but a private prescription for something like Dazepam can go unnoticed for so long, but the risk of patient harm is still huge. You know, if you're giving out cocodamols, codidromols, zopiclones, um, your schedule threes regularly, or schedule four part ones, um, it can cause harm to patients. And we thought that needed to change. And I think that's one of the reasons, or one of the main reasons that we started Signature Rx. I'm, I'm guessing then as, as a sort of, because I, I think I, I find as as you know, I, I know you're a fellow sort of tech geek. <laughs> I like I I love the potential of AI, and I've been like absolutely blown yeah. away by its use, essentially, of monitoring massive organ, you know, like banks, yeah. essentially, to to monitor yeah. fraud. You know, like just just like yeah. you're talking about, really, and you know, it it can essentially it's almost a bit like Minority Report, where it can essentially by detecting behavior and certain patterns, it essentially like learns over time what is normal, I guess, yeah. like dispensing behavior in this, in this instance. Yeah. And, it, and it can, it can tell you basically, oh, this person is fraudulent. You know, like the, the, the amount that they're yeah, doing yeah. this or the, the person, the one person that they're prescribing this to is having too much. And yeah. like, like that, that, that side of it, like I said, you, you can almost like, you can, you can tell, you can almost, uh, you can predict that someone, maybe they've, they've not done it yet. Maybe they've not done anything fraudulent yet, but you can, yeah. the, the technology will be there in, in a paperless system, yeah. in a purely digital yeah, system yeah. that says, hey, yeah, this, this person's about to start doing fraud on prescriptions. <laughs> so probably like intervene. Yeah. That, that blows my mind. But at the same time, it blows my mind to think, how is it that you know the, the banks and financial institutions and computing and tech companies all have these systems but we don't do it for drugs which is yeah. you know the pharmaceutical industry isn't a small it's not a small time industry <laughs> the, yeah. the money is there if if you know if we wanted to back you know like if it wanted to be publicly or i say publicly funded but i mean like a, a yeah. plc not not government funds because god knows that <laughs> there's not enough of that to go in pharmacy um yeah, i agree but yeah I don't, I don't understand why this this isn't a bigger a bigger well, topic firstly banks are a very controversial subject because we don't know how well they do it for their laundering um how well they use ai for their laundering like prevention side um but also from a pharmacy point of view yeah right there's a lot we can do you know if we have a central database which stores information security for all patients around the country we make private telemedicine companies share data. So it shouldn't be optional. I think if someone's giving care in the UK, 
there should be a central shared database. Um, because at the moment you can go to a private telemedicine company, four, you know, four different private telemedicine companies, get prescriptions from them, and then your, do your doctor down the road has no idea what you've just done. So a shared database about all private, all NHS um, care, and then with that, we can use AI tools to really predict patient care. And you can go further with that. It doesn't just need to be, um, you know, is this person susceptible to fraud or is this going to be a, a patient that's going to try and get high risk medication? You can look at health trends. Um, you know, you can say patients which take this trajectory of health normally end up like this, and this is what you can do to prevent them. Yeah. So you can use AI to prevent serious illnesses further down the line. Uh, and predict them and make people that are predisposed to certain conditions with certain genetics and whatever go to the right like places for testing before it gets there mm. but th this is um, like uh, I, I, was just, I was just thinking you know you sorry you just sparked so many like you know offshoots <laughs> in my head there because it, it made me think of uh, have you seen the netflix documentary uh, take your pills I think yes, I have. Um, yeah. Was it about Adderall and like yes. those? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, in America, and and I was just I, it just made me think what you were saying there. It made me think about how you could essentially spot these trends growing in country, you know, like growing across. Yeah. Like, like, why is yeah. it that we're using so many more of these? Jungle? Why is it so many people now are on these when when they weren't ten years ago and things like, I, like the the like you said the the potential for data in in things like this is massive. Yeah. But but it all it all depends on it going digital because you can't. Uh, it's almost exactly. like you can't have a a half in half out approach. It's like swimming. You can't swim yeah, yeah. with half of your body in the water and half yeah. of it out. Like it's got to exactly. got to dive in at one point. Yeah, you need this one connected system. You need to make sure that it's done safely. So we need to make sure that patient data isn't shared. We're not extracting data and sending it to America. Like all of that stuff can't be happening. It needs to be solely for the purpose of this. So you need to kind of get rid of any corruption or any kind of um, ulterior motive. It has to be beneficial for the patient. And you know the the cost benefits would be huge if it's done properly. The amount of money we could save on secondary care admissions or secondary care treatment could be huge just by having early diagnosis. Yeah. Like early diagnosis, patient care would be more improved. Um, doctor's time will be lifted because you can tell patients before. You know, we think you need a checkup of a blood. You know, a blood check or yeah. whatever go to your local center or whatever rather than going to a gp getting an appointment and then doing it i mean it's convincing people who are spending the, the money on these sort of things of those benefits i guess but for so i don't know why it takes so long like i think i was i was probably about 15 or 16 when i was thinking why don't the government like just why don't they promote more healthy exercise and and invest in yeah. bike lanes <laughs> and things like that and and, and then maybe they won't have to spend so much on the obesity problem when it happens in, in 15 years. Yeah. And lo and behold, 15 years later, they started doing that sort of thing. And it's like, well, ha if you just started yeah. that way back when, you know. And you can apply that if anything. It could be a lot of healthcare, like not just obesity, but a lot of different conditions. You can apply it throughout. Yeah, no, it's, it's, an, it's a very exciting time, I think. But mainly in the private sector. Like I was speaking to this one company recently and it's slightly off topic, but I think it's a really cool company. We're talking about tech and AI, so I'm going to throw it in. But you know with the pills at the moment on the NHS, if you, this is the contraceptive pills, right? If you go to your local GP, they'll give you the cheapest pill out there with the least side effects and just give it to you. But actually, in reality, everyone reacts differently to them. The chances are you will have side effects. It could put you off. So there's a company out there that actually look at your whole profile, they'll ask you a load of questions, look at your genetic data, uh, or based on your history, what you could be predisposed to, and recommend pills for you, which will cut down side effects, cut down re-prescribing, cut down the number of appointments you have, and actually give a better patient outcome and satisfaction from the start, rather than loads of trial and error ways. Mm. Um, and it, it would be cheaper if you think about it. If you kind of have one appointment rather than four appointments, even if the pill's more expensive at the start, slightly, it could yeah. still work out. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. We'll cut it there, man. Thank you. Genuine, genuine pleasure. Thank you. And I'm Have sorry, Mr. Thank you for applying, but yeah, same with you. Take it easy. See you later. Cheers. Bye.